Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, sponsored by ACR, America's Card Room, where this week we started the $5 million Venom PKO. It's a progressive knockout bounty tournament with a guaranteed prize pool of at least $5 million. Satellites are running now for this event, which also has day ones on Sunday, April 23rd, Thursday, April 27th, and Sunday, April 30th. My name is Clayton Fletcher, and I'm your host, here in beautiful New York City. That's right, my travel has come to a halt, at least for the moment. But, you know, every single day, all I think about is the World Series of Poker. I have WSOP fever. I don't know if I'm actually going to survive. I'm not, <laughs> not going to make it to May 30th, which is when my flight departs for Sin City. And this week, the WSOP confirmed something that I reported about a month ago here on the podcast, that there will not be any single table satellite tournament action this year at the WSOP. Some are speculating that it has to do with the United States Treasury and being concerned with money laundering or other federal crimes that could, in fairness, I suppose, potentially be committed through the use of $500 WSOP tournament lammers, I suppose. But whatever the reason, it is off the schedule this year. They are instead having lots and lots of mega satellites. I'm not too happy looking at them. Some of them have rake as high as 16%. Now, I don't mind paying 16% rake in a tournament where the prize I could potentially win might be in excess of 100 times the buy-in. But given that the prize in these mega satellites is less than 10 times the buy-in, it seems to me like that is too much rake to pay, at least for the lower buy-ins. For example, there's a $240 buy-in where the prize is $2,000. So even if only the $40 is taken out, and I'm not clear at this point, on whether they're also taking out a dealer appreciation, 3%, 4%, or I've even seen 5% in the past. So let's assume that one out of 10 wins a seat. That is too much to pay, 200 plus 40. That is a 20% rake, as far as I'm concerned, and that's just too darn high when the most you can win is under 10 times your buy-in. Now, I might be a bit of a rake knit, and some of you will probably play in these anyway, particularly if that is your only real shot at competing in one of these bracelet events. But my advice would be take that same $240, play a cash game, try to spin it up that way because you won't get as killed on the rake. Now, it does get more reasonable at the higher buy-ins. For example, if it's 1100 to win a $10,000 seat and they're actually taking one out of 10. So they're only taking out $100 for an entry fee that I'm kind of okay with, but that's about the most I want you guys to pay to play in a mega satellite. Otherwise it's just too hard to beat the rake. More rake is not better. So if you look at the uh, prize structure for the old school sit and goes that they're not going to be having this year. In the early days, you would pay $275. And of that $2,750 worth of buy-ins, a full $2,620 would go to the prize pool. And make no mistake, guys, that was a big part of what made those sit and goes so profitable. Even in later years, when they reduced that 2620 down to 2600 and even last year it went all the way down to 2580 that is still beatable for a decent but not great 
mid-stakes professional, particularly when you take into account the quality of the competition. Now, I expect that some of these low buy-in satellites, mega satellites, that is, will have very soft fields in their own right. But still, I don't think you guys should be paying 16% to play in them. So enough of my rake lecture. <laughs> you guys can tweet me if you disagree or agree at Clayton Comic on Twitter. And today I don't want to talk about how Poker Go is getting involved in the ridiculous grudge match between Matt Berkey and Nick Airball. I want to talk some more about day three of last year's World Series of Poker main event. So this is the 2022 main event. I am very excited, if you can't tell, for the 2023 edition of not only the main event, but of all the poker tournaments that I can't wait to play this summer in fabulous Las Vegas. So when we last left our coverage, we were about 65 spots away from the money. And just a few minutes later, it was all the way down to 40 spots away from the money. Now, I sometimes wonder how well they are able to keep track of the bust outs and whether those clocks are actually updated in real time or anything resembling real time. You may recall last week we were focused on the featured table, which showcased not only Cliff Josephy, but also the great Lonnie Hui. And we are going to get back to that table. But first, I'm going to talk about a different table, which featured two players sitting right next to one another, both with the last name Tran. And these guys are not related. Tran is actually Vietnamese for Smith. It's a very <laughs> common last name. So in this hand, the blinds are 3,000, 6,000 with a 6,000 big blind ante. And we are 40 bust outs away from the min cash when Stephen Cuz Buckner opens off of 665,000 from fourth position, which you may know at a nine handed table is also called the low jack. Now, if you're not familiar with Stephen Buckner, he is one of the old school, adorable characters in poker back when poker players used to have personalities. They call him Cuz because he calls everyone else Cuz. He's also known to always have an unlit cigar in his mouth. He's a funny guy, something of a throwback to the golden age of poker. So he makes it 15,000. So that is 2.5 times the big blind. And on his immediate left, Kenny Tran of Arcadia, California, which I believe is near the capital city of Sacramento, makes the call. Now, I haven't told you what anyone has yet. And as we've been doing in the last few weeks, I'm just going to reveal one player's cards and put you in the driver's seat playing the role of that player throughout the hand. So next to act is another Tran, and his name is Luther Tran, and Luther has the Jack of Hearts, Jack of Clubs. So Buckner opened from the low jack off of 665,000, and then was called on his immediate left by Kenny Tran off of 500,000 from the high jack. And now here we are in the role of Luther Tran, with a stack of 381,000 holding pocket jacks in the cutoff, what should we do? Well, before I tell you what we did, I want to tell you that I actually know Luther Tran. I will actually never forget his name because one of the most memorable WSOP main events for me was 2015, which is the first time I ever made it to day five. Also, the first time I ever actually cashed. So as I was about to play day five, some members of the comedy community were beginning to take notice that one of their own was doing pretty well on poker's biggest stage, one of whom was J.R. Havlin, who's a good friend of mine, great comedian, former writer for The Daily Show, The Tonight Show, you name it. He's uh, got an incredible comedy resume. Well, heading into day five of the main event, JR took a look at the list of players returning, and I believe I was in 32nd place at that time, and Luther Tran was in 33rd. So JR said on Twitter, 
Clayton's shouting on his way to the table, I got you covered, Luther Tran. Now with something like 400, 450 players remaining in the tournament, it really didn't much matter that I had a few thousand more chips than Luther Tran, but JR is a funny guy and he made it a thing. So I have actually played with Luther Tran. I can tell you guys his playing style, at least eight years ago anyway, was uh, pretty conservative, but he would definitely take a shot if need be. In this hand, we have pocket jacks in Luther Tran's seat. And the question is, should we overcall or three bet? I don't think any of us are planning to fold pocket jacks here. That's ridiculous. Even 40 off the money in the main event. Remember, Cuz had made it 15. Kenny called. And now Luther, off of a stack of 381, makes it 52,000. And the action folds all the way around to Kenny, who says to himself, but out loud, why do I always put myself in this position every time? And he starts shaking his head. If you watch this action unfold on Poker Go, it really does appear that Kenny is about to lay down his hand. It's quite convincing. And I think that Luther, who had his eyes absolutely glued to Kenny, may have been surprised when Kenny finally decided to make the call. And now the two trans are going heads up to the flop with 134,000 in the middle. The flop comes king of clubs, five of clubs, four of spades. King, five, four with two clubs. Hero holding pocket jacks, including the jack of clubs. And Kenny checks. So what to do in Luther's shoes? Well, let's first talk about this flop. King of clubs, five of clubs, four of spades. You might say this is a somewhat wet board, but I don't really know, guys. I don't know if Kenny Tran is going to put in 10% of his stack before the flop with a hand like seven, six, eight, seven of clubs. I really don't think that too many of those hands should ever be in Kenny's range for calling a fourth position open from Stephen Cuz Buckner, who is a fairly tight player himself. Players tend to lock it down this close to the bubble of the main event. Now, that doesn't mean he can't possibly have one of those hands. I would just discount them maybe a little bit more than you otherwise might. Another factor to consider is what kind of hand would make that speech before the call? So when Kenny, Kenny's a very experienced professional player, and when he says something like, why do I always do this to myself? Why do I put myself in this position every time? He could be saying that with pocket aces. He could be saying that with a garbage hand. But when he makes that speech and then makes the call rather than a three bet, I think that we can rule out some of the best possible holdings or at least discount them as well. One thing I know for sure, this is an above average flop for Luther Tran in this situation, but that in itself is not a reason to bet the flop. Do we need to protect our pocket jacks? Well, certainly we don't want to give a free card to a hand like Ace Queen, which I think makes a good amount of sense. But I believe that most of Kenny Tran's range is going to be pairs and therefore mostly pairs lower than jacks. I don't think that he would ever play pocket queens this way. I really doubt that he would play pocket aces this way. So he could have a hand like pocket tens, pocket nines. And where we don't want protection from those hands, we should try to get some value from them on two of the three streets. So we could check here and then bet, bet, or we can bet here, check the turn, and then bet the river, targeting a hand like pocket nines. Luther decides to put the chips in now. He puts in 51,000 into the 134,000 pot. So a little chunkier than one third of the pot. And Kenny rather quickly makes the call. So what to make of that? I think things are going to plan, or I should say according to plan. I think that in Luther's shoes, I would not be concerned about that call. I mean, look, we made the small bet because we want these kinds of hands to be able to pay us off. So, so far, so good as far as I'm concerned, if I'm Luther. So now with 236,000 in the middle, and by the way, Luther, hero, 
has only 278,000 in his remaining stack, the turn comes the 10 of diamonds. So our board is now king of clubs, five of clubs, four of spades, 10 of diamonds. And once again, Kenny Tran checks to Luther Tran holding the jack of clubs, jack of hearts. Now, I believe that in Luther's shoes, I would not be too happy about this card. Remember, we thought that one of the hands that makes a lot of sense for Kenny Tran to have is pocket tens. And so at least some of the time, this 10 of diamonds is going to be an absolute disaster. So I think given that and the fact that we got check called on the flop and given the fact that we don't really want to try to get the whole stack in, I think this is a great time for pot control. We made a small bet on the flop. We have a two, but not three streets of value type of hand. A scare card hit the turn and our opponent checked. It seems to me like a great time to check behind. And that's exactly what Luther Tran did. So he checks behind and we're going to the river. The pot is 236,000. Hero with 278,000 in his stack. And the river comes the deuce of hearts for a final board of king of clubs, five of clubs, four of spades, 10 of diamonds, deuce of hearts, king five, four, 10 deuce. So the six tray got there? (laughs) I don't know. Do we think that Kenny Tran could possibly have six tray? I kind of doubt it. And now, out of nowhere, Kenny Tran bets 125,000 into the 236,000 pot a little bit less than half of Luther's stack. And this is a brutal spot. What would you do in Luther Tran's shoes holding pocket jacks and facing this bet of just over half the pot offering you just worse than three to one on a call? So much to think about. Does he have pocket tens? Does he somehow have a king? If he does have a king, what kings are really in his range for playing this way? Remember, he called an open from his immediate right and then called our three bet closing the action this is a tough one i really don't know how many kings he could have i guess king queen suited i doubt he would mess around this close to the bubble with king jack suited but kenny tran he's not really known for being particularly tight so is it pocket tens did he flop a set with pocket fives or pocket fours He could have a busted flush draw, maybe a hand like ace jack of clubs. But actually, guys, the solvers are starting to teach us that we shouldn't be bluffing with those hands very often. So if you're in Kenny Tran's shoes with uh, a busted flush draw with like an ace jack of clubs, maybe ace queen of clubs type of hand and you didn't get there, you really don't want to bet too often with a hand like that because that means that Luther hasn't just been bluffing all along with a flush draw very often. And so he will normally have value. And then you're going to end up trying to bluff into a king or possibly even better. For that reason, GTO has us not bluffing very much at all with our busted flush draws. So then what does Kenny Tran have? Well, actually, (laughs) I just realized we have the Jack of Clubs, which makes Ace Jack of Clubs impossible. So really, what is the only possible flush draw for Kenny Tran to even have ace queen of clubs I don't even know if he would be in there with ace 10 of clubs this close to the main event bubble and even if he does have that hand he's got a pair of tens now which is probably enough showdown value to not turn his hand into a bluff at least not most of the time so I think in Luther's shoes it's pretty tough but players don't really bluff on the river as often as they should. If there is a player who does, it's probably somebody like Kenny Tran who understands the psychology of the main event bubble and is capable of a lot of different things. But I'm just having so much trouble putting him on a hand that can bluff. The only one I can really think of is ace queen of clubs. And again, that's not really supposed to bluff very often. I suppose seven, six, is pretty hopeless now with a seven high. But look, guys, I mean, do we really think that Kenny Tran even called the raise in the first place? 
with 7.6? And then did he call another raise with it? It seems unlikely to me. So I suppose that Luther should just fold. And Luther does fold the pocket jacks. And Kenny made that speech about why do I put myself in this position every single time with the ace of hearts, king of diamonds. By the way, cuz opened with king queen. So it's pretty unlucky for, for Luther that Kenny managed to flop a king when there was already one in the muck, but that's the way it goes sometimes. And yes, Kenny Tran was not bluffing and Luther made a good fold on the bubble. All right. Well, as promised, I want to get to the other featured table from this tournament. The one that includes Lonnie Huey and Cliff Josephy, Johnny Bax. So now we're 24 away from the money. Everyone in the room can feel how close we are to cashing same blinds, 3,000, 6,000 with a 6,000 big blind ante. And the action folds to Austin Apicella, who makes it 14,000 to go off a stack of 865,000. He's doing great. The average around this time is around 450,000 or so. So he's loving life. There's nothing like having a big stack when the bubble bursts in the main event. So Apicella opens from the hijack to 14,000. I'm not going to tell you what cards he has just yet. Folds to Lonnie Huey on the button. And she's got 1.2 million, guys. What a World Series of Poker main event she has been having so far. She's got about three times the average stack. She's got her whole table covered. And she's on the button with pocket tens. All right, so Apicella opened to 14K from the hijack, and we are now on the button with pocket tens. The blinds are Cliff Josephy in the small with 870,000 and Matthias Auer with only 198,000. So he's the short stack at the table and he's in the big blind with 198. So what to do in Lonnie's shoes? I mean, look, you, you've got pocket tens against the late position open from the hijack. Um, a player you know very well. Austin and Lonnie are friends in real life. She knows very well that big stacks on the bubble of the main event tend to be a little looser, a little more aggressive, and her hand is certainly strong enough to three bet. But Lonnie takes a more conservative approach, just flat calls on the button, kind of inviting the blinds to come on in and join the party, maybe just hoping that her positional advantage can do the work rather than a three bet. Totally defensible play. I prefer three betting most of the time in this spot, but you guys know how I play on the bubble <laughs> and get myself in trouble some of the time. So Lonnie just calls and then Johnny backs Cliff Josephy also calls from the small blind. Now he's got a stack of 870,000 and then Matthias Auer of Vienna, Austria Calls for 8K more, closing the action. Now four to the flop, and with 92,000 chips in the middle, the flop comes ace of clubs, seven of clubs, deuce of spades. Ace, seven, deuce with two clubs. Hero holding the 10 of spades, 10 of diamonds. Cliff checks, Matias checks, and Apicella fires out a continuation bet of 30k into the 92,000 pot. Uh, what would you do with pocket tens on this ace high board? I think it's pretty tempting to just throw the tens away here. We've got two more players yet to act behind the blinds. Either one could really have an ace, right? I mean, maybe not ace king or ace queen as many times those hands would go for a three bet, obviously. I think folding is totally fine, even though we're getting four to one and there's some chance our tens are good. But Lonnie's going to play her button here. She just decides to call. She takes the good price and she's going to see what develops. At that point, Cliff Josephy overcalls from out of the small blind and Matthias Auer folds. So now it's just the three big stacks going to the turn and with 152,000 in the middle, the turn comes the king of spades. So our board is now ace of clubs, seven of clubs, deuce of spades, king of spades, ace seven, 
deuce, king with two clubs and two spades, hero holding the 10 of diamonds, 10 of spades, and both players check to Lonnie. What to do with pocket tens? Well, I mean, the king, obviously you can check. I mean, it's not a good card for us, that king of spades, although it does pick up backdoor spades. And so Lonnie holding the 10 of spades could potentially bet now and then represent that flush on the river if that should come in, like the backdoor spade draw. She could also perhaps bet kind of big now and then bet really big, like maybe an over bet on the river, really putting somebody to the test on the bubble, representing that top pair type of hand or maybe better than that and trying to get them to fold out a hand like king queen that picked up a pair of kings on the turn. That's all very possible. But look, guys, when you're up against two good players like Cliff Josephy and Austin Apicella, just because they check to you doesn't mean they don't have anything. It means they might not have anything and they probably don't have a monster. But these two checks on the turn are not necessarily indicative of a white flag <laughs> giving up kind of behavior. Lonnie must not have thought that her pocket tens were good enough to beat two opponents in a showdown because she decided to put in a bet into 152,000. She bets 70K, so just under half the pot. And Josephy calls Apicella folds. And I'll tell you what he had in just a minute. Right now, with the pot at 292,000, and just as the dealer is about to throw down the river card, Cliff says to Lonnie, who I assume he knows fairly well from all the different tournaments they've probably played in together over the years, he says to her, don't hurt me. He said it out loud, and the mic picked it up. And the river came the nine of spades for a final board of ace of clubs, seven of clubs, deuce of spades, king of spades, nine of spades. So the backdoor spades did come in. And before I tell you about the river action, I just want to remind you guys about the TPE free roll this Sunday on America's Card Room, a $1,000 tournament with no buy-in at all, $201 for first place, limited to the first 300 players. If you want the password for the TPE free roll on America's Card Room, you got to join the Discord. That's right, the Tournament Poker Edge Discord. And there's a link in the description to this podcast that you can click on and join that Discord for free. We have an ACR channel. We have a strategy channel. We have a podcast channel. So join the Discord by clicking the link in the description. And if you're not Yet playing on America's Card Room, what are you waiting for? Click the other link in the description to this podcast and you can join ACR and receive a 100% first-time deposit bonus up to $2,000 just by using the promo code T-P-E. All right, let's quickly recap the action. Pre-flop Austin opened from the hijack and Lonnie called on the button, as did the blinds, and four players saw a flop of ace of clubs, seven of clubs, deuce of spades. The blinds checked to the razor, who bet 30K into 92K, and Huey and Josephy both called our folded. And then with 152K in the pot, the turn came the king of spades, which brought backdoor spades, at which point Cliff checked, Apicella checked, and Lonnie bet 70K into 152K, holding the 10 of spades, 10 of diamonds, at which point Cliff Josephy called and Austin Apicella folded. And now with 292,000 in the middle, the river came the nine of spades, bringing in back door spades and Cliff Josephy checks once again what to do with pocket tens in Lonnie's shoes Remember, you do have the Ten of Spades. And before that river came out, Cliff said to you out loud, don't hurt me. Well, Cliff checks and Lonnie bets 195000 into the 292000 pot, a two-thirds pot size bet with pocket tens. I'm pretty sure she's bluffing here. I don't see how 
Cliff can call with anything worse than a pair of 10s. We do have the 10 of spades. And just imagine how Lonnie felt when Cliff said raise to 575000 I mean, obviously, she can't call. She can't shove. She's just got to throw her 10s away. Cliff picks up almost 400 k in this pot. Now, Lonnie had that 10 of spades, a very important card, a flush blocker, but that didn't stop Cliff. He had the nuts, ace of spades, seven of spades. He flopped top two pair and checked and called. Then he turned to flush draw, checked and called again, and then rivered the nut flush and went for the check raise and got maximum value as Lonnie Huey turned her hand into a bluff. By the way, guys, I told you I would let you know what Austin Apicella held, and he had the seven of hearts, six of hearts, so on an ace, seven, deuce flop with no back doors, uh, he flopped middle pair, did a C bet, and then pretty much gave up after that. To me, this is just a brilliant, brilliant hand by Johnny Bax. Uh, it lets you see what kind of fortitude it takes to go deep in the main event, as Johnny Bax has done a number of times. How many of us would actually have had the patience and willpower even to play such a big hand? so slow. Well, that'll do it for this episode. You guys, if you haven't done so yet, please give us a good rating on Spotify or a nice review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps more people who search for poker on their podcatchers to find us. If you guys do that, it doesn't cost you anything and it really goes a long way and helps us out quite a bit. So if you haven't done that yet, please take a minute to do that now. On Spotify, you don't even have to write any words. Just give us that five-star rating. And on Apple Podcasts, if you want to write a sentence or two, it really means so much to me. And therefore, I thank you in advance. For everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge, and with special thanks, as always, to our generous sponsor, America's Card Room, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you so much for listening. I want to hold them like they do in Texas plays. Fold them, let them hit me, raise it, baby, stay with me. Lock in intuition, play the cards with babes to start. And after she's been hooked, I'll play the one that's on her heart. Baby, when it's love, it's not rough, it isn't fun, fun. Oh.